afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, social integration for inclusion is much easier today than it was when some of us were growing up. Because some of us went to um, an institution and uh, it wasn't open education or it wasn't integration. So a lot of what we had to do was to you know, do trial and error and of course we had committed and dedicated um, sisters uh, who were Irish and they taught us a lot of it. But now when children are growing together side by side, um, the tendency that one will be embarrassed is just not there. People will learn, you know, children can be very, very innocent. They ask innocent questions. As they grow up together, you know, uh, a disabled child could ask his or her friend how to do certain things. And, uh, you know, innocently, the non-disabled child will be willing to explain. That's one thing. Number two, I think we also have a role to play in this. I recall when I was growing up, we had um, committed friends who would visit our institution, take us home, and make us feel part of the family. We would do everything the kids in that family were doing. We would go to uh, the beach, we would go uh, swimming, because they took us away from that secluded environment. So sometimes you could serve as a role model for your family could even be a mentor to a disabled child. When you take the child, maybe if they have exam, what we call exam, one day, maybe in a month, they are allowed to go out and integrate. You could, by and large, help them to develop social skills. But I know that as they go home from school, if they are gay students, as they you know, go home, um, we should be able to have home teachers and some other people that will help their parents realize that these children are part of the family and they must be taught everything that the other children are doing because we have to learn to iron our clothes, we have to learn to do some cooking. So when I was in school, for instance, it was not as difficult for the Reverend Sisters had to put us through all of that. So we must be committed if we want them to achieve social integration. Like I said, it's easier today than it was many, many years ago. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. The issue of uh, social skills is the essence of inclusive education. Just like the last speaker has said, inclusive education is the open where everybody or every learner learns. And the goal is to acquire knowledge. And how do we get that? This interaction right from the childhood encourages a lot of socialization. You know before, it used to be institutionalized, special schools, where there is a lot of barriers to social skills or social accusation. They only grow up within their lives. So there are barriers. And today, with inclusion, the goal is social skills accusation. These uh, children or persons with special needs do not have a excluded society after the school. When they stay there from childhood, say to primary school, secondary school, they would eventually graduate into adulthood, into work life. Which society are they going to be? You have excluded them. You have deprived them from learning the basic, from learning everything basic. So they sort of segregate, they congregate among themselves, which becomes a problem later in life. So the essence of inclusive education is to break down every barrier, right for home, community, school, and adulthood. This is just what I want. I think um, basically we're talking about a heterogeneous group of people, not a homogeneous group of people. So that means that um, each person with an intellectual and developmental disability may need particular support. 
And the only way to find that support really is a tried and tested way of doing a functional analysis. So that means that you look at the history of the person, the family they've come from, the environment, the um, resources that they've had, the diet, the what lighting, it may be that somebody is exhibiting challenging behavior because they have particular sensory impairments. And, and um, having done lots of consultancy up and down the country and in different countries, it can sometimes be that uh, the people that individuals are living with are causing a lot of their distress. So it's only really by doing this, it's a fancy word to say functional assessment, but actually that's all that it is. It's looking at the person in a, a holistic way and seeing what particular therapy would help them. It's no good just administrating drugs to all people with IDD, because that won't work. It's no point in having a program of mindfulness, which is is great in its sense, in itself, if that is not appropriate for that person. It may be that each individual, you know, or a particular individual needs a range of interventions that will include some occupational therapy, that may include a bit of medication, but may include one-to-one uh, -one support to enable them to live active and full lives. And I think it's only by doing that holistic assessment that we'll know. So I don't think that just go to a psychiatrist or just go to a clinical psychologist or just go to a GP is ever going to help. I think that you know we need this, this, first of all, this holistic assessment and then using the tools from uh, or active support, or a range of these um, scientifically, um, these have scientific efficacy, well how do we know that? Because um, the research that's been done on them uh, has been peer-reviewed in, in journals, there's been experimental designs have been done, so there's quite a lot of history of these types of therapies. Uh, but I've never ever pushed one particular therapy over another, because the main thing is to get diagnosis, which is what my colleague has been saying, and secondly, to then see, to work with the individual in a very particular way, and to find out exactly what that person is about. Do they have communication difficulties? Do they have sensory impairments? Do they, have they had abuse, and is that what's upsetting them? And why they're behaving in a particular way? Have they, are they grieving because of loss? Because of the loss of their parents or the loss or are they lonely are they depressed you know a range of things so that we can help each individual and that goes for people with mild learning disabilities but also people with moderate severe learning disabilities too thank you very much um, one of the approach that we use at uh, the inclusive friends was first we, we did we did a mapping of uh, local communities where there were children with disabilities who had never enrolled in school. And while we did that, we had a strategy to bring the parents together first. Uh, to first break whatever perception they have or whatever belief they have regarding that child with a disability. So we had a forum with them where we had to do more like to, to unlearn their ways, what they are used to. If we're able to break through that period, it's easier to break through the child. So the first approach is first the period. And we went as far as bringing the community heads together. The women leaders, the traditional leaders, the religious leaders, and even like disability cluster leaders in, in those communities. We brought them together to see the need why the child with disability needs to be educated. Not just educated, but first to even understand the kind of disability that that child has. When you understand that, you could know what level of, of, of treatment or what level of exposure to give that child. So our first approach was first the parents and then the community leaders and then to the child. Hello, I'm advocating. So that's what he has said. 
based on what you said before asking about the use of technology, how we're going to move it forward, right? I'll give you an example. Um, if a child is presenting with a very challenging behavior, a behavior that challenges and has no speech, for instance, the first course of call for me would be to go to a speech therapist because we think the child isn't speaking and that's a problem, right? And like uh, Professor Person Rachel said, you get the proper diagnosis, right? And if that child, for instance, has autism, which is where we come from, we would also want to, before them, we want you to get a hearing test. When you rule out everything else, the child is in, doesn't have any hearing impairment, you move to the next level. And one thing we try to tell parents is that you may have a child whose voice you would never hear. And that's where technology comes in. So we first of all have to disabuse our minds from this thing about my child or this individual must speak. They don't communicate, right? They've got sign language, they have um, gadgets like tablets and everything. So if it's a child on the spectrum, for instance, and you never hear the voice, the technology would move in would be any other augmented form of communication. So if you're using a functional communication method, for instance, using pictures to teach that child, that's technology, right? The child communicates with pictures. If a child can't continue using pictures and they would rather, and they're, they're quite mobile, there's no um, mo uh, mobility disability, you then move to the next one. It could then be typing. There's, there's the iPad, there's the whatever, their phone. Does it make sense? So it's not about just going out there and getting the whole of Nigeria or Parliament to start advocating for the There are certain things that can be done on a one to one basis. But the beginning is getting that child properly assessed and diagnosed to know what the gaps are before determining how you want to fill in those gaps. It makes sense. Also, talking about technology in our contemporary Nigeria or our contemporary classroom teacher training, anything that assists or make the child learn better is what is considered technology. When we hear technology, we think it must be a gadget, it must be a machine, it must be... No. Just like she has said, in classroom, for example, you have uh, some children who have Down syndrome or intellectual disability. I have one in my center where the, the, the child is very hyperactive. He can sit down and he is Down syndrome. His upper limbs and lower limbs are all impaired. But he can't sit down, he wants to jump. The only technology we, we use to allow him to sit for a while is to make his chair a little bit uh, uh, strapped. Not for too long, because when he's strapped for too long, you are now imprinting in his right. So technology, even in classroom, pictures, like she has said, we are teaching the hearing and hearing, pictures, music, even if he does not hear, you believe he does not hear, but bombarding children, especially after assessing them and knowing their level of hearing sensitivity, you bombard them with language, you bombard them with music, you do everything. Total communication is technology. Uh, I was speaking with one of my colleagues earlier and telling her uh, an experience I had on TV. When a woman had a child who was autistic, doctors had ruled out that the child would ever speak or do anything meaningful. This mother was very adamant. She said, that child, the person in that child, my child is locked in there and I must get him out. She defied everything the doctor said and started researching on the internet until she got help. And the, the expert told her that what she should do is to watch the child, study the child, be close to the child, and know exactly what the child wants. And because of that, she made sure she took the child everywhere she went, exposed him to this child television shows. 
And she discovered then that the child's attention was drawn to this children's play using puppets. And the child was able to smile at the screen. So that was very strange to her because he didn't have any eye contact. So based on that, she capitalized on that experience and made sure that all these children's programs were, you know, the child was exposed to. At the time they wanted to switch the channel, the child will jump up, receive the, um, what do you call it, the remote, and change the channel. So she discovered that that was the child's interest, you know, when puppets were involved. So gradually she started making puppets, and anytime she wanted to com uh, communicate with the child, she would hide her face and use her head and was talking verbally, but the puppet was doing it. Eventually, she was able to get the child to talk. So that is a basic technology. And that was television. So these are the little things. Capitalize on what the child wants, what he can learn. So from there, you can advance it. You begin to get in a small laptop, you know, let a lot of softwares, and you will get to manipulate. So eventually, the child was able to talk. So this is a, a very good innovation that parents can capitalize. Uh, disability is not a human condition that wants a simple solution. So the issue of technology here, if I was talking about the little disabled persons, technology can make a lot of difference in the life of a person with disability. Because a lot of my study participants, I ask them, how did you feel the first day you used the wheelchair? And the kind of answer they gave really baffled me to show that it shaped a lot of things about their lives. Then the question is, how do we get the wheelchair for a lot of persons with disabilities in the village that don't have access to wheelchair? There are some persons with disabilities that have five wheelchairs. Then there are some who do not have wheelchairs. Because of that, it affects their educational chances. Even some parents had to carry their kids on a wheelbarrow to school. So I think the person we should be asking, whose responsibility is it to make wheelchairs available? Is it available to poor families with people living with a disability? I saw that question coming, and it's quite a important question, and it goes back to what we all said initially. Social inclusion is more of a, like a solution or a intervention and before you do an intervention you have to know what you're intervening for example you gave for example how do we bring these people into classrooms where you know they, people can't cope with them or in a situation where a team says you know the child doesn't want to go to school the simple the, the simple is what does the child have at what level time didn't allow me to go into details with the levels of various disabilities Disabilities are in severe rates, they are in different levels. For example, if that child who is grown is well diagnosed and we find that this child is profoundly, profoundly disabled, physically, intellectually, or wherever it is, there is no need trying to put that child in a class where his age mates are because he probably he would, he would learn and understand. So the first step will be educating that child especially in school where the child will get will grow enough to a stage where you will now social include the child to where you know the child will follow on. But it goes back to diagnosing the child rightly to know what the child has in the first place to be able to know what intervention they're going to give that child. Social inclusion is not an open-ended thing for everybody with disability. In classes, in classroom, the classrooms can handle the pressure because it's going to affect those who don't have disabilities as well. So it has to be clearly defined in case by case basis to be able. In the UK, there's a lot of
of social inclusion, but there's a lot of special schools as well. So there are special schools for people who cannot attain the level of their normal age mate generally. So social inclusion has to be done with a lot of additions to it. Someone also mentioned something about, you know, when an older child is refusing, I think the child is refusing because the child has not understood or has not been taught enough to understand to be that level. So there has to be also interventions to let that child grow from their level. Um, okay. Something that I've always said to parents about, you know, Professor Hager, the older children, I want to believe that 18-year-old probably didn't have early intervention or wasn't visible early enough or was visible but they didn't have the resources to help that child. Therefore, what I always say is that when you have a diagnosis, when you make yourself visible enough to be diagnosed appropriately, then you'll be placed appropriately. You can also have a one-to-one -one intervention. You don't necessarily have to be taken to a school or a class where you're bigger in size and then therefore you put up a behavior which ends up excluding you from that environment. So you can offer the one of one. And also, it's not, I, I take that emphasis again, it's not every single person that will attain the academic level that we imagine all the children should, regardless of how much intervention or inclusion, and that is a reality we must as parents and individuals, both professionals and the general public, take away. When we have that at the back of our mind, or we face that reality, we then shape the sort of um, intervention or help that we provide for that individual. Therefore, if that 18-year-old has been diagnosed and can only add one plus one, there is no point spending time trying to get them to do two times two. What you then begin to focus on is giving them skills that will sustain them as individuals in the greater environment and society. Therefore, it may well be that I'll need to give that child a calculator, teach the child how to use the calculator, and how to change the battery of the calculator in case it dies when he's doing two plus two. So simple recognition of stuff to help him move forward in his, and then you begin to train the skills that are requisite for the person to sustain and not be a burden to himself, society, or the family. The person can end up being a shoemaker, whether we like it or not. There may be people that that will be their level. And there's nothing wrong with that. What he's done is that it's taking the burden off the family, it's taking the pressure off the society, and the person is living a meaningful life. And then we just ensure that the quality of that person's life is improved. Simple. So, back to your crowded classroom, unfortunately, part of what we try to do now is to create awareness in schools. So that's what, something that we've also decided to take on, because we've read that not everybody that studies special ed is equipped to see these things. So part of what we're trying to do is get teachers and schools to work with us so that they learn the basics and they're able to identify some of the um, uh, symptoms, if you may. Because we also found that that, that wasn't even there. People didn't even recognize what the symptoms were, either for ID, autism, whatever. As long as it wasn't a physical disability, they had no clue. So they need to learn that before, before they can, like you said, the teachers and service providers be able to even help. In a, uh, I just want to uh, respond to Dr. Who talked about uh, teachers and teachers training for inclusive education. Grace, I will tell you yes. Today, NCE is the base, is a minimum qualification to teach in our basic schools. And we have special need uh, uh, students taking NCE is special need education. And another thing is that most of our public schools, or schools besides their public general schools, are inclusive classrooms. Because you will find in such classrooms some uh, learners there who are exhibiting 
from learning disability. And teachers who are general teachers may not understand this. And they will tell them, this child is stubborn, this child is lazy, this child is poor. It's because that teacher is not trained. And there should be a special need teacher in that class. What is happening today is that we are turning out a lot of special need uh, graduates. But the government or the system seem not to uh, recognize them. And then even those of us who are professionals, we are shy of maybe not us here, but many people who are coming up are shy to say that they are special educators because they will not get job. If you are with the Federal Ministry of Education, you will know that in the civil service, like in Polytechnic, we train people with NCD, special need education, diploma in rehabilitation sciences, diploma in psychosocial sciences. All these are supposed to be in the school system to help the general teacher so that some children will be identified, will be taken for right assessment, and then right placement will be done. And such teachers will help the general teachers in the classroom to be able to use the different method because the classroom is full of diverse ability. We have differentiation curriculum and also coming back to the curriculum. Curriculum is being adapted, being uh, uh, restructured so that it can fit the need of the population in the classroom and the diverse needs in the classroom. Yeah, I would just want to add concerning the 18 year old child who has been diagnosed mentally and is functioning at a very you know, low level. The important thing there is to know about the intelligent quotient test, particularly as it affects children with mental retardation. We have the chronological age and we have the mental age. So chronological age is the actual age of the child and he does not, you know, he must not function at that level. When the IQ test is done, then that will determine his mental age and he ought to function at that level. So no matter how big he is, the resource room is there to take adequate care of him, just as somebody said. We then use the one-to-one -one system of teaching. He doesn't have to go and be locked in a general class with younger children while he's functioning you know, as big as it is at the level of three to four. So, mental age is very, very important. If even he is 18, he can function as children with two or three, three years. So you meet him at his point of need and therefore provide that service to him on one-to-one -one basis. Don't go and lock him in a class one or class two and expect him to function there. Socially, he is going to be a misfit. Thank you. Yes, uh, inclusive education is good. Yes, I don't think it's everything. As others have spoken, these things are treated on case by case basis. Because we are going to know our parents more poor for that specialist education. I don't think that makes any sense in system on putting, a, for example, a deaf and dumb child in a public school, in a mainstream school, whereas there are special teachers in specific schools that can teach the child at the level. Then another thing is this, disability is not about tragedy. It can lead to creation of new skills, it can lead to creation of knowledge that have not been there within the general population. So, within the deaf community and the community of people with uh, visual impairment, you discover even there yeah, that this group of categories have developed specific kind of knowledge among themselves through their disability. So, putting them in special school, for example, now, for the deaf, deaf community means you are denying that person a particular culture developed through within that community and now you want to just force the person 
against his own will. So this should be voluntary. Parents should be given the opportunity to choose for their kids, and their kids that have grown up should also have the preference, the choice to make it for themselves, instead of thinking that inclusive education is everything. You could also bring about a solution on the reverse side if we do not follow them on case by case basis. Um, I guess the summary of that is yes, inclusive education is good, but also there needs to be caution because there seems to be a lot of emphasis on including the child. But again, there has to be the right impact structure to cater for that child. Like, Dr. Gail rightly asked about overcrowding in the classroom. Um, if teachers are not appropriately trained, I mean, like you, you train your teachers, but if they're not appropriately trained, they're not going to be able to implement that as such. I mean, is, the, is including the child in the mainstream society going to work for the child? Or like Chidi was saying, some, some students would need to be trained or taught in an individual life or even in a special school. Um, the next question, which links to what you were saying, and um, just to correct earlier what you said about deaf and dumb, it's deaf and mute. And linking to that, someone asked a question about um, the conference being an um, international conference on disabilities in Africa, but we seem to be focusing more on IDD. So, it, I mean, the focus for this year was specifically on IDD, but obviously throughout the conferences we've heard from different speakers, we've heard from people who are talking about um, people with physical disabilities, we've heard about old age, um, we've heard about IDD, we've also heard about um, hearing impairment. Um, so you know, it's not just about one specific. But going to the other question, you were asking about how we don't have um, physically challenged hearing, visual, or other types of disabilities. Like I said, we touched upon it throughout the conversation. A year cost, okay. So I'm not going to give you detailed answer for every one of them, okay. I mean, the first, let me start with social, social problem of mental health, drug abuse, occultism, substance misuse. They are only a finite, minute part of mental health. Mental health is broader than that. So when I talk about mental health, I talk about affective disorders like mood disorders, depression. Bipolar, psychoaffective disorders, and all that. Psychosis, great schizophrenia, paranoid disorders, and a whole list of them. And so, professional jargon, someone says, that's why I don't want to call it professional jargon, so I want to leave it for 15 minutes. I can't give you all the mental health disorders. So, those mental health disorders that happen in day to day life are also evident in people with disabilities. And for obvious reasons, if you do not include people as well as speaking, they get depressed, they get left out, you know, and then they will hear voices in their head, which are different voices, which are not their voices. They will also feel isolated, and when they feel isolated, they eat less, you know, when they eat less, they sleep, they don't sleep well, they're all depression and relative psychotic symptoms. That is it on its own. So I won't go into details. We can, we, I can talk to you privately about other list of mental health and other related to disability. So what you, you once you ask me, this is what we call substance misuse related mental health problems. All right. Madness and mental health. Well, how much time do you have again? From where I come from, from the school of thought where I come from, there's nothing like madness. If Things are properly diagnosed. If you take a proper history, you can take the history of where that, you know, what you call madness come from. What symptoms are they presenting with? What symptoms are they are, are they showing you? That will help you diagnose properly. I can't, you know, emphasize diagnosis enough because if you get the right diagnosis, you get the right treatment. Wrong diagnosis leads to wrong treatment. Regarding that. If we don't get the right diagnosis, we don't know if a child or a situation goes to physical health, hearing impairment, you know, mild, moderate, or severe. It's all, everybody with all, all kinds of disability. If you want to 
find an intervention for someone with a mild learning disability. The intervention is different for someone with moderate, severe, or profound. How can we, you know, diagnose properly in Nigeria to be able to get the right death? That was your question. That is where forums like ISDS come comes in. I mean, the first, the first thing they told me is to train professionals to diagnose these things properly. That's one of the reasons why I got involved. Professionals that know what they are doing, who are properly trained, will be able to diagnose rightly. So in some cases, te technicians, because it's not all done by medical bits. It has this, it's a holistic diagnosis. So the, the question will be, how, how do we bring these professionals under one roof? How do we bring them together to be able to give that services? Multidisciplinary, you know, to be able to give that. In my, in, in my slide, we saw a list of professionals that it takes to give this diagnosis. My day-to-day -day job is a psychiatrist, a learning service psychiatrist to, to be able to diagnose. Before a patient gets to me, they have seen about seven professionals. I now bring it together, pull it together, to be able to know what symptom is more predominant and which one, you know, is, should be focused on. Some people have mild learning disabilities and they're doing well in school, but that does not mean that, that they, they don't have disabilities. They're doing well in schools and they're the one person troubles in class, probably. You need to find out why they're person troubles in class. In most cases, they have ADHD, they have attention deficit hypersensitive disorder. If you treat them with medication, they get well, they blend well, and that is their treatment, and they do well. And they go on to go to uni, they go on to become whatever they want to become in life. They have the medications, when it happens in the morning, they will be able to sit still and listen well in the in class, understand what they're being taught in their place of work, wherever, and that's the treatment for that. Well, I know, as I know, I was in, I was in Nigeria two years ago about ADHD. There is no ADHD forum, proper forum in Nigeria, in Africa as a whole. So such forum, where ISDS comes in, is what we need to bring the professionals together, make the right diagnosis. Until we have the right diagnosis, we won't have the right data. And until we have the right data, we won't have the right solution. So we have to go back to the basics. It might be expensive, but we need to do it properly. If we keep the you know, cut and joining things without doing it properly, we will still be where we are or we will go any forward. I don't know if I've answered all the questions in finite details. Uh, from part of your question, you we were trying to link uh, learning disabilities to mental health. And uh, learning disabilities, as you know, you are a student of learning disabilities. Uh, children that you find in class every day, most of them you can never say they have disabilities because they just sit there. But they are not able to cope. And so such are those that the teachers will say, you are stupid, you are dumb. Didn't you hear me? Talking, you don't talk to a great person. You have some of them that have dyslexia, they can't read. And so when it's time to read, you know, they are not there. There are some of them that have language problems. So there are so many of them categorized as learning to say for their children. I, most of them, when given the right proper training, they end up doing very well. But when you want to take it to mental health, I know you've been uh, on a teaching practice or when you have gone to psychiatric. Uh, uh, hospitals to work with these children. You know, it's not that maybe dropped out of school as a result of not being identified and assessed properly as being learning disabled. Out of stigma, out of labeling, out of all of these frustrations they drop out. So that frustration will lead to depression, lead you to falling into being out of school and then identifying with uh, your peers that will make you take drugs. That's uh, the time you find maybe the mental health. It doesn't mean that every child that has a learning disability can be linked to mental health. I just want to know that. Uh, the child has probably not cooperated in class or not doing it as well. I think the problem or the cause is with our education system. Ideally, every child going into school should be screened. Child should be assessed. And if there's anything we should present to government, in the community, see how government can cooperate with other practitioners in the private sector to ensure that each child is properly screened before placement. And one 
Somebody asked a question about you know, where the access to wheelchairs and things like that. Unfortunately, we live in a you know, society where greed has become the order of the day. I know that from time to time, the Ministry of Women Affairs would give each state of the Federation some wheelchairs to pass down to uh, you know, persons with disabilities that need them. Whether those things get to the community or not is another thing. Most times, you see those things even being sold. And even after we have insisted that they should be branded so that you know, they know it's not for sale, some will still do something funny. So we still need to perhaps call you know, a, a conference for social workers, for community leaders, now these things are not meant for sale, but they are meant to better the lives of you know, children with disabilities. And this is where parents also come in. When the parents have a support group, like uh, you know, one of the speakers said, when they come together as a group, they should be able to go to their state headquarters and say, these and these are our needs. How can we access them? And if they will write as a group to federal ministry, they might be able to even give to that group because they know that it is a group, not an individual. You know, we, we still, we are still work in progress, actually. And uh, another thing is we need to let uh, government realize the fact that the curriculum in uh, tertiary institutions, particularly for those offering education, must include on basics in special education, whether you are going into special education or not, you should be able to have fundamentals and you should be able to identify children maybe when you see them with the help of doctors. And this is where uh, medical personnel also come in. When a child is brought into their clinic, they should be able to identify maybe what problem the child has so that they can begin to document and with one part of their data maybe in that hospital. I know that uh, the Ministry of Human Affairs has been working with uh, NPOPC to be sure that they get it right, and uh, National Bureau has got it to, to be sure that they get it right when they have the next uh, uh, census. But, um, you know, whether they get it right or not is another thing, but we've been working seriously, we've been holding series of conferences and workshops and things like that. So we're just hoping that they will get it right. I think one of the major issues here, and it's something that I've, I've observed even in this conference, is that there is uh, that, that people are misunderstanding definitions. Um, so people are, you know, learning disability um, with is is really about people with a, a low IQ of less than seventy. That's very different from people with a learning difficulty who with a bit of like dyspraxia or dyslexia, which with a bit of help in school with special education needs, they can overcome that. But those people might have a very high IQ. It's the same with people with autism. They may have a very high IQ, uh, but they may not. They may have a learning disability in, in, in as well. And I think there's, there's huge issues here around what, you know, definitions. And I think there's, there needs to be um, much more sort of just well, basic education around those definitions so that people understand what they're talking about um, and then we can really look at and collect um, reliable data because at the moment we're never going to collect reliable data if people are confabulating um, diagnosis here because people are confused the second point really relates to the, the gentleman who said that, that really there being um, an emphasis on this conference about intellectual development and disabilities. And I don't think we make any apology for that because there is so much confusion about what intellectual development and disabilities is. And because it's, it's people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that within the whole gambit of the term disability are the most invisible. Um, and I think that's, that's the issue here. So before we start talking about reliability data, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do around sampling and reliability, but it's the definitions that we need to get hold of, that we need to grab, and people need to realise the differences between mental health 
learning disability, learning difficulty, and autism, and physical disability. Following on that, and um, data collection, Professor Hager, you would be happy to know that I would love to come to your village to do take sample because the, my PhD research is on screening tools for people with LD and IDD and autism. So what, what we hope to get out of it is to take a tool that's gold standard and adapt it to be culturally sensitive and then use it to screen. So in doing that, we'll get um, data, reliable data. And we'd love to go to the rural areas as well. We'd love to go to the cities, work with schools. And it's not going to be sufficient. It's just a starting point. So if, even if we had 500 participants at the end of the day, that's just 500 out of 200 million people, which is nothing. So that's to build. Okay, so I would really love for everyone here to help me out so we can move forward, I guess, with what I'm saying. I think uh, we'll be happy to hear about this. I was sharing with Rachel a while ago that the British government is so passionate about the issue of disability in Nigeria that uh, the Prime Minister has stepped into uh, service provision and what have you. Right now, the Honorable Minister of Human Affairs and Social Development must have just ended a meeting with the Prime Minister because the Prime Minister herself invited the government to come and say what exactly they want to do for persons with disabilities before they know how to come in. Because they cannot bring help when they don't know precisely what you want to do. So I, I think that's a cheering news because um, right now the Joint National Association of Persons with Disabilities, um, you know, a few of them are in the UK, the Minister and the, um, the Permanent Secretary, they didn't want any junior cadre officer because they want to hold government responsible for whatever they say they want to do so that they too can bring in their own um, service to the table, whatever they have to offer. So I believe with this uh, arrangement and with this uh, interaction, we should be able to ask the government, what have you decided to do for persons with disabilities? And then we should be able to go back to the British government. This is what they said they would do, but they are not doing. And this is what British government says it will do. Are you really doing it? And then we should be able to hold the Association of Persons with Disabilities also to account because they will be there when, when government is defending herself and government will be there when the community, the disability community is defending itself before the um, British government. So I think we are really moving in the right direction. Quickly, I want to say that for everyone seated here, Someone asked me a question earlier, she's no longer here, but what can everyone sitting in this room do immediately when they hear about that they are going back to their various work and communities? First is to equip yourself with disability knowledge. You need to understand the terminologies first and foremost because if you are trying or if you call yourself a disability advocate or a social inclusion advocate, you don't call people handicapped. You know, you're careful, you're careful of mentally retarded or imbecile. Sometimes you may think it's harmless, but it's a big turn off even for that community you are advocating for. So equip yourself with disability knowledge. There are a lot of courses online that you can take. And even organizations as ours and other organizations can take you through those trainings. And lastly, uh, the honorable uh, member who talked about um, the sponsoring the bill, there is deep, if you, any one of you can get your hand on that bill, Please look at it before the public hearing because there are still gaps. And then they come up with this very interesting, beautiful bill and they think they have actually solved our problem. But in it is not even holistic. A, a, a quick example, he was talking about the aviation sector where he said, you know, right now they, they are actually implementing it already where there are wheelchairs everywhere. I have a personal experience where I've been flipped, I've been flopped a couple of times in the airport. 
It's not just carrying me with my, my, my wheelchair. I have my wheelchair, but then you bring your own professional, or rather your own airport wheelchair to take me to board a, uh, a plane. What happens when I need to get to my seat? I am paraplegic. What happens to our Nigeria airport having an aisle wheelchair? We don't have it. If I'm traveling out of the country, automatically the services are different. But when I'm back home, it is completely different. So it's not just enough to have wheelchairs to move people around, but please join your voice and advocate along with me. Sometimes when you see how I'm carried into this plane, you will feel for me. You know, it feels like a bag of potatoes. Someone carrying my leg, and these guys trying to feel my body, feel my breast, in the process of trying to carry me to my seat. And when they do that, sometimes they ask for tea. That is their job, but they ask for tea. And I remember clearly one in Lagos told me, Madam, we don't go, I don't go carry you next time. You don't like giving people money. I said, but that is your job. So please let us get our hands on this bill. Uh, and look at it. So that during the public hearing, we address these issues. So they don't just bring out a beautiful document, but yet there are still gaps in it. And then please empower a child with intellectual or developmental uh, disability to use their own voice. Either vocally or using their eyes or whatever methodology, empower them to speak for themselves. Thank you all the panelists. You can now go back to your seats and